Random taco shop, San Francisco, 2008. I'm 22 and eating a tongue burrito with my buddy Ryan. Ryan loves web comics. He regularly drops references to Saturday morning breakfast cereal, equal and questionable content. His wardrobe consists of three pairs of jeans and dozens upon dozens of webcomic t-shirts, each with its own obscure in-joke emblazoned on it. He's pitching me on an idea. A webcomic set in a crypto zoo. What the hell's a crypto zoo, I ask. You know, cryptozoology, Bigfoot, Chupacabra, Loch Ness Monster. We should do a webcomic about it. We? Yeah, dog, he says. You write it, I'll draw it. <laughs> I'm intrigued. I know how cool webcomics are. Webcomics are to regular comics as indie movies are to the big studios. Quirky, cult-based, and fueled entirely by pluck and a can-do spirit. We spend the rest of the meal mapping out the backstory, who our main character is, what tone we should strike. We're super jazzed about this venture. This is the comic book nerd version of, we should totally start a band! <laughs> It was a cool idea, but with college about to end and neither of us knowing what the hell we're doing with our lives, it kind of died. Until two years later. <laughs> if ever there was a nerd version of Holly Go Lightly, Marcy would be it. We went to high school together. She tells me she has a job working for a very well-known Adult Swim cartoon, which is the coolest thing I have ever heard. Someone I know, from my shitty hometown, is moving to New York to work for a popular TV show. She mentions meeting up at Comic-Con later that year, and I immediately buy a one-day pass. The second the purchase goes through, I look around my childhood bedroom, at the Staples name tag on my desk, at the fact that it's 12.30 on a Tuesday, and I'm still wearing pajamas. I'm living at home with my parents. My life has become the cautionary tale for post-collegiate malaise. I panic. Comic-Con is in July, which means I have roughly six months to do something halfway impressive to escape suburbia to not be a failure. I have to do something. I think back to my friend Ryan again. He has this battle cry against an action. Do a thing, idiot. If I was waffling between getting drunk with him and watching a flick, do a thing, idiot. If it was a choice between getting a burger or eating a tongue burrito, do a thing, idiot. If I didn't talk to that girl because I was intimidated by her, do a thing, idiot. Since we graduated, our lives had split like that one Robert Frost poem. While I retreated to the banal safety of my hometown on LA suburb, Ryan stayed in San Francisco and lived the prototypical slacker lifestyle. He worked at a quickly dying video rental store, grew mutton chops, and smoked weed out of an R2-D2 shaped pipe. <laughs> Come on, dude, I say over an eager IM session. Let's do a thing, let's be webcomic guys. I expect some resistance, but his response is, all right, cool. We spend the next week doing a thing, hashing out our story. Our main character, Milo, is experiencing the same doubts we are about finding his place in the real world. Milo's dad died mysteriously and left him a crypto zoo, a tourist trap that houses the beasts of urban mythology, Bigfoot, Nessie, and the Chupacabra. It's nerdy, silly, and entirely trivial, but Ryan and I treat it like it's the next Watchmen. We argue over tone and punchlines and character sketches. We share massive Google Wave files of ideas. Ryan buys a Wacom tablet, and I illegally download script writing software. I even copyright the dang thing. Our webcomic goes live with the unwieldy URL worldfamouscryptozoo.tumblr.com. Yes, it's still there. We have no idea what we're doing. I call myself a writer and majored in it and everything, but I never, ever finished a story. My notebooks and word files were all half starts, and this could be a good hook for something someday. I don't have the discipline or self-control to write something on a regular deadline. Ryan is a better artist than me and can pull off an above-average doodle, but has never drawn a comic. I write around the fact that he can't draw one-point perspective. But the killer of it all. We're getting stuff done at the last minute, and Ryan shoulders the lion's share of the work. He is penciler, inker, letterer, and copy editor. The first strip takes him a solid 12 hours. 
But no matter, we'll learn it on the fly. We're sure that we'll get ahead of the crazy schedule. Our first strip goes live on January 31st, 2010. Our first story arc introduces our little world while trying to sidestep plot holes and foreshadow half-baked ideas that we're not quite sure will be anything but might be something, sort of, maybe? <laughs> our respective Facebook and Twitter accounts are entirely turned over to self-promotion. Every post has a link to the most recent comic, and we beg and bribe our friends to spread the word. We watch Google Analytics like it's tea leaves that will spell our fate. <laughs> our success is modest. We gain followers on Tumblr, our stuff retweeted, and a friend reposts our strip to a comedy website he works for. We get some feedback from other webcomic guys. We even receive a piece of fan art. <laughs> it feels good. Fuck that, it feels great. Like we are finally doing something worthwhile, distancing ourselves from our lowly lives. I don't care that I'm unemployed and living with my parents. My great delusion is that those two little details will be there to provide color and backstory when the comic really takes off. It's about a month in when Ryan and I have our first big blow up. He calls me, stoned and giggly, pitching an idea about Milo playing with a turd as a kid. Dude, there's no way I'm doing a poop joke, I say. Come on, man, Ryan says, his voice thick and slow. I created this thing, too. We yell and fight until one of us hangs up in disgust. As, Ryan, as friends, Ryan and I are great, but as creative partners, we may be toxic. All the stuff that I admired about Ryan, his sarcastic cool, his blasé attitude toward what he was doing with his life, his laid-back job, was all a cover-up. In the middle of our third story arc, things are the best they'd ever been for the webcomic. We decide that we'll go big and tell a story in which the zoo is overtaken by tree squids. <laughs> Ryan sends me the art for our 17th and final strip. It is beautiful. He'd drawn a fucking killer perspective panel, one with a lot of action. It was dynamic and detailed, like something you'd see in a real comic. With the art comes a message. It's heartfelt and simple, devoid of all the dramatic bullshit that had come to color our communications. He was done. He hated being broke all the time, begging his parents for grocery money, not getting laid, and spending his weekends shading a Mexican folkloric creature. <laughs> Maybe we get the comic going again, but for now, CryptoZoo was on an indefinite hiatus. I'm furious. He's killing something that just got good. I was so wrapped up in my own need to escape that I selfishly blocked out everything he was going through. We don't talk for months. In July, I still had my Saturday pass to Comic-Con and took the train down to San Diego. I meet up with Marcy. We walk around the con. I don't have much to say. She talks about New York, her new job, how she's trying to coordinate a panel for her bosses, what after party she's going to. I'm on the outside looking in again. I go to a friend's house and drink so much that I throw up on his couch. <laughs> Ryan and I patched things up as best we could, and we're still friends. We don't really talk that much anymore, but that's mainly due to, you know, life, distance, time. But we co-created a webcomic. For 17 weeks, Ryan and I produced something I cared about, something I'm still proud of. For 17 weeks, we fought because we took it so seriously. For 17 weeks, we were true, independent, broke-ass, in-over-our-head artists. For 17 weeks, we did a thing. Thank you.